Hello, I'm the Resolute Cartographer, and this video covers Sugar Grove, a naval base in Appalachia that performed several duties for the United States government in the years before the war, none of which that seemed to have been a part of its naval radio station cover story. Every player that goes through the main quest of Fallout 76 will go through Sugar Grove when connecting MODIS to that site's hardware, but there's a lot more to the site than just that. The cover story for Sugar Grove is that it's a naval radio station, as identified by the exterior-facing signage. In the real world, naval radio stations are used by navies to communicate with their submerged submarines. Standard radio waves do not penetrate the ocean surface to the operating depth of most modern submarines, necessitating the use of VLF, very low frequency, and ELF, extremely low frequency radio transmission. VLF radio waves can penetrate the ocean surface up to 20 meters, allowing submarines to either operate at a shallow depth, or utilize communication buoys that rise to the proper depth for reception. VLF data transmission is inherently slow due to its narrow bandwidth, allowing for a transmission of 300 bits per second, or approximately 35 8-bit characters of text per second. The transmission antenna of a VLF array are large. The Jim Creek Naval Station in Washington State, for example, has mile-long suspended cables making up its transmission array. Due to size requirements, VLF is a one-way form of transmission from naval radio station to submarine. Unlike VLF, ELF waves can penetrate the ocean surface up to typical operating depths for submarines, meaning that submarines should be able to receive transmissions at any time without having to rise near the surface. While this might make ELF seem like a superior method of transmission to VLF, ELF is worse both in terms of bandwidth and in terms of the size of the transmission array. While VLF allows for the transmission of 35 characters per second, ELF allows for only a few characters per minute. While VLF transmitter arrays might cover a few square kilometers, the broadcast array for an ELF transmitter can be up to 60 kilometers long and use megawatts of power to drive the transmission. In the United States, the Navy operated ELF facilities in Claim Lake, Wisconsin, and the 135 miles distant Republic, Michigan until 2004. With this information in hand, I believe that we can conclude that Sugar Grove in the Fallout universe was neither a VLF nor an ELF transmission site, and thus that the cover story was little more than skin deep. Its true main mission focused much closer to home. This in-game site has a real-world counterpart, to which it is far more similar than many of the other in-game locations are to their real-world counterparts. Sugar Grove Station, located about two and a half miles east of Sugar Grove, West Virginia, operated under two different governmental bodies, the NSA and the Navy's Naval Information Operations Command, until 2015 when the Navy left and sold their property at the site, leaving the NSA in sole control. In 2005, the New York Times reported that the NSA site at Sugar Grove was responsible for intercepting all international communications that entered the eastern United States, a mission that seems to have been the inspiration for the in-game Sugar Grove. Hidden beneath the public facade lies the Sugar Grove Signal Intelligence Base with this motto of Ade Vide Tace, or Hear, See, Be Silent. From this site, the United States Navy was spying on the American people, which leads me to a question I've not really considered before, and that is, what is the state of the intelligence agencies within the Fallout universe? We know from the switchboard in Boston that the Defense Intelligence Agency existed in the Fallout universe. But if the Navy had the mission of monitoring the people in Appalachia, where was the NSA? When I looked into this question, I had to delve into the history of the NSA itself and its origins as it was converted from the Armed Forces Security Agency to the National Security Agency on November 4th of 1952. The Armed Forces Security Agency was itself created through the centralization of all military cryptologic activities on May 20th, 1949. It seems in the Fallout universe that though this centralization might not have taken place, the evolution of the mission from wartime counterintelligence to widespread monitoring of the American people does seem to have taken place, based on the range of topics that the signal intelligence base here at Sugar Grove monitored. A diagnostic test that can be performed on any of the SIGINT terminals reveals the existence of 76 listening devices hidden across the region under the codename Orbuculum, another name for a crystal ball. Sugar Grove monitored striking steel workers in Grafton with a presumption that they were communists, and they tried to do what they could to get the steel flowing again. They monitored miners relaxing at the Rusty Pick, fearing that they were trying to organize. They monitored the Free States movement, plotting their moves against the Separatists for once they had the resources freed up to deal with them. They even spied on other branches of the United States government when they attempted to monitor the activities of the army in Huntersville. In their constant monitoring, they did occasionally come across threats to the American people, the Chinese intelligence base beneath Mama Dolce's in Morgantown, for example. But they did not stop at simply monitoring the American people. In certain cases, they destroyed the lives of suspected enemies of the state. The best example we have of this comes in the record of their interaction with one Edgar Arson. Mr. Arson was surveilled both physically and financially over the course of four months before he was arrested and subsequently killed after two months in captivity, leaving behind two children as orphans. What was it that had brought him to their attention? He showed up on a union's attendance rolls. In the same log that we learn about the tragedy that befell the Arson family, we learn about Evelyn Aberdeen, who fell into suspicion when she applied for a Chinese visa. Though this shows something of the scope of the actions that would catch their attention, her case is an odd one, as the United States was in a shooting war with the Chinese, in China, at the time that she applied for a visa, making me wonder what her goal was. 
The scope of sugar gross interest spreads beyond monitoring individuals of the American population, though. Amongst the desks in the main room of the Signal Intelligence Division, we find a desk devoted to monitoring the power grid. There is a desk for studying cryptozoology. Oddly enough, the last holotape recorded by the cryptozoologist covering her encounter with the Wendigo appears to post-state the war by two days. A holotape recording the death of reporter William Breyer as he investigated Hornwright Industrial's Motherwood project leads me to suspect that they were monitoring the press as well. But the SIGINT division wasn't the only division in the base. In a small room overlooking the main signal intelligence room, we find a skunk work site. In this office, Chief Scientist Kyle Lockhart ran multiple high-tech projects, including a few that we get to read about. On the unsuccessful side of things, we find Project Locus, a plan to generate swarms of drone vertebrates with the goal of infiltrating enemy bases and hacking their systems, a plan thwarted by size restrictions. As a quick side note, this project sounds like the foundations of the vertebots, but we'll get back to the other projects. Project Barrier lies in the unsuccessful column as well. Barrier had the goal of creating a gamma radiation dampening field to protect soldiers in the field. This project was stymied by exponentially increasing power requirements to scale it. Last but not least, Project Spotlight strived to use neutrino pulses to map military installations. When Sugar Grove tested this tech on unaware civilians in an office building, they incited a sudden mass psychotic episode at the site. But Kyle Lockhart did not fail at every project, and we can find the record of two successes here. Project Siphon and Project Pulsar. Project Siphon produced incredibly high-density holotapes with an onboard program that searches out high-value data within an enemy network and copies it to the Siphon holotape. This project was the first we know of to yield working results, but the iridium-infused tape led to a cost of $15 million per tape. When two of these tapes ended up lost, the project was reassigned to the SIGINT Analysis Division, who would remain in charge of monitoring the tape use until the end came. Project Pulsar is the only project in Kyle's shop that was made successful after the war. Project Pulsar had the goal of producing tactical electromagnetic pulse weapons for use by intelligence agents. Kyle was working on a prototype, but he was experiencing a slow cycle time in his testing. He managed to automate the process and went from four tests a day to only one test every eight minutes. He left the system running when he went on vacation on October 8th, 2077, hoping to have enough data when he returned the morning of October 18th, 2077. Unfortunately, Kyle didn't do the simple math to know that in the 9 days, 16 hours he would be gone, the system would run the test 1740 times. As the test started running non-stop, power use skyrocketed, forcing N. Greaves, the worker in charge of monitoring this power supply of Sugar Grove, to tap into the civilian power grid, causing brownouts in Menonga on Monday, October 11th. By Thursday the 14th, Kyle's test data had clogged the entire server mainframe at Sugar Grove. When he returned to work the following Monday, October 18th, he was greeted with an email from T. McAllen, the general overseeing Sugar Grove, announcing an on-site inspection the following Monday. The test data was fragmented all over the server and completely impossible to analyze, not to mention the power bill Kyle had racked up for Sugar Grove and the mass quantity of resources that he had used in making these 1740 robots he had destroyed for science. Kyle knew that the only option was to utilize one of his old siphon holotapes to collect all of his data. Unfortunately for Kyle, Patricia Nunez, the analyst in charge of dispensing those tapes, was unwilling to lend him one, suggesting that he attempt to use standard holotapes to analyze the data. And so Kyle sat down at his desk and attempted to copy 183 holotapes worth of data for analysis. He was unsuccessful in his time and appears to have died at his desk, but thanks to the work of the residents of Vault 76, his work has brought forth posthumous fruit. In the course of working for the Mistress of Mystery, residents can borrow a siphon holotape and use it to collect all of Kyle's data into one place, yielding a working prototype. But even the monitoring and research were not the only things taking place at Sugar Grove. Hidden from even most of the analysts is the black site of the Somnus Initiative. In Roman mythology, Somnus was the personification of sleep, a fitting namesake for an attempted sleeper agent program run out of the black site. The Somnus black site is host to several cells, a small barracks, an infirmary, and a brainwashing station. The cells each have a bed, sink, and toilet with access to a communal shower. The agents of the Somnus Initiative were everyday people. The only restrictions the initiative seems to have placed on itself was no one with an immediate family, no one of insufficient intelligence, and after a bad result from programming an orphan, no children. Though the goal of the project is not fully explained, we do know that at least one sleeper agent neutralized a bank robbery in progress using their own unknown hand-to-hand -hand combat abilities, actions they don't remember taking part in after the fact. This is the sole success detailed in the data we can find, and the side effects seem to have been fairly bad. One agent returned to the black site missing an arm, being completely unaware of the fact that a bear had attacked them. The orphan I mentioned a moment ago effectively ended up requiring orders to perform any actions, incapable of making their own decisions. The Somnus Initiative seems to have been the human intelligence counterpart to Sugar Grove's main signal intelligence division. Though we don't really know what happened here on Saturday, October 23rd, 2077, I'll speculate on the events of that day. The day dawned calm and cool. Analysts working the weekend shift were on site as usual, along with facilities workers and the marine detachment attached to the site. As the sun rose, 
The early warning started to come in. The nuclear bombs were speeding towards them. In the ground floor bullpen, analysts gathered sensitive documents and piled them up for burning. Four limousines carrying VIPs arrived, their occupants racing inside to find shelter as the bombs drew near. When a vertebrate crashed into the roof, the analysts abandoned their work and ran for cover as the Marines erected barriers to guard the north end of the parking lot and block the gates with cars. When the bombs came down to their south, the occupants settled in to wait out the worst of the fallout. The people who made it to the site would eventually leave, some likely hiking west over the mountains to their original intended destination of the White Spring Bunker, but that's all that I could glean from the site. I think that'll do it for Sugar Grove. This has been the Irresolute Cartographer. If you enjoyed this video and you want to see more, hit the subscribe button. If you liked it, hit the like button. If you have any comments or questions, leave them for me and I'll try to get back to you. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you again next time.